As we uh, gather, shall we just uh, pray together? We beseech the Almighty God, mercifully, to look upon thy people, that by thy great goodness they may be governed and preserved evermore, both in body and soul, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, my title for the third of these lectures is a quotation. Maybe um, if you can guess who it's from, you get a free bun at the end or something. God is everywhere, but not only everywhere. God is everywhere, but not only everywhere. Well, in this session, I want to begin to turn to the theme of God's presence. And to do this, I want to reflect on what are, at first sight, some rather disconnected topics. The omnipresence of God to creaturely reality, divine providence, and the covenant between God and creatures. The connections will, I hope, become clear as we proceed. In treating this material, we're moving from theology proper to economy. That is, from talk of God in himself and of the inner works of God to talk of God's external works. If we allow our minds to be led by the material logic of the Christian confession, this move is necessary, for God is the one who, having life in himself, gives life to the world. A doctrine of God, which stopped short at discussion of God's imminent perfection, would be truncated, even distorted. This is the force of what I was talking about at the end of yesterday's lecture, the principle of inclusion. However, in moving to discuss the economy, we don't leave theology behind because everything that's said about God's relations to creatures and creatures' relations to God has immediate reference back to God in himself. This, of course, is the force of the other two principles we were talking about yesterday, the principles of derivation and sequence. An alert dogmatics mindful of the need for proper disposition of its material, will give itself to both themes in due order and in that way try to point to the mystery of the gospel. The treatment of the material that I'm going to try out proceeds by passing, as it were, through two concentric circles. The outer circle is that of God's omnipresence and, more specifically, of God's providential ordering of all things to their appointed end. The inner circle describes the history of the covenant, that is, the execution in time of the fellowship with creatures which God elects for himself and into which he elects creatures. This inner circle, which, following, of course, Jonathan Edwards, might also be called the history of redemption, this inner circle is the chief matter of revelation, though not, of course, its only matter. At the centre of both these circles lies a very special history, that on which all else turns. And this is the history of Emmanuel. And this will be our concern in the next lecture. Around Emmanuel, then, are ranged, first of all, the history of the covenant, and then second, the wider history of creation, each in its distinctive way, a sphere of God's active presence. Now this way of ordering the material reflects the way in which cl classical Protestant divinity divided what it called the external works of God, the operaciones dei externi, into the work of nature on the one hand and the work of grace on the other hand. The work of nature comprises God's works of creation and providence in which he brings into being, sustains and perfects a creaturely reality other than himself with its own integrity and substance. The work of grace comprises the entirety of God's saving work, stretching from the proto-evangel in Eden through to the consummation of all things. And these two spheres of operation, uh, the sphere of nature, the sphere of grace, are held together by the fact that in them, the one God is at work. In both of them, God's purpose or decree is enacted, and in both of them, God's glory shines forth. 
cosmology and soteriology, so often, of course, segregated in modern theology, belong together in this kind of scheme. My ordering of the material also echoes, though this time a bit more distantly and critically, another arrangement classically exemplified in Augustine and familiar in Roman Catholic dogmatics, namely one in which presence is a term for God's overall relation to created reality, whereas the particular intimate relations between God and his human creatures is designated by the term inhabitation. The difference here, of course, is one between God's objective presence and acts and God's received indwelling. Augustine makes the distinction in the famous letter to Dardanus on the presence of God. It's letter 187. But it's lucidly set out by Aquinas um, in a passage um, in um, uh, uh, Prima, uh, uh, paragraph 43. He says, There is one general way whereby, as the cause present in those who share in his goodness, God is in everything by his essence, power and presence. Over and above this, he says, there is a special presence, consonant with the nature of an intelligent being, in whom God is said to be present as the known in the knower and the loved in the lover. And because by these acts of knowing and loving, the intelligent being touches God himself, by reason of this special way of being present, we have the teaching that God is not merely in the intelligent creature, but dwells there, as in his temple. Well, if you remember from earlier on, when we were looking at the work of Congar, inhabitation, indwelling, temple, it's perhaps not a very happy idiom. Not only because it threatens to, elude, to elide the distinction between uncreated and created, but also because, unless it's carefully handled, it can move away from the um, agential and historical idiom of Scripture. Because of this, for my money at least, covenant fellowship is a preferable way of characterising the end of God's presence to creatures, uh, in the inner circle of his dealings with the objects of his favour. At this point, the preference for covenant fellowship over inhabitation is a point I want to return to towards the end when we're looking at God's presence among the communion of saints. Three further presuppositions uh, I want to identify before we proceed to the main exposition. First of all, um, this is um, a kind of repetition of something that we've already talked about, but I think it bears repetition. Whatever's said about God's external operations in the work of nature or the history of fellowship is, as it were, suspended from the doctrine of God's perfect life. God in himself is the origin and end of his relations to creatures. He alone is the beginning of his works and their end. In classical reform theology, of course, this suspension of the economy from theology was articulated by teaching about the divine decree, the antecedent will of God before time, according to which all things are ordained and of which temporal occurrence is the execution. There is, of course, something profoundly correct and scripturally informed in this, isn't there? Above all, a breathtaking sense of the sheer weight of God's prevenient reality. But it's worth noting that the idiom of decree will serve only if two conditions are fulfilled. First of all, it must be stripped of associations with abstract voluntarism, otherwise decree will shade into arbitrary determination unattached to the divine nature. And second, it has to function within a material Trinitarian theology of God's fullness. God's decree is his unswerving determination to glorify himself by glorifying creatures. It's not mere causal force. It is purposive, loving initiation. That from which God's external works proceed is God's being as creator and perfecter of life. Second presupposition God is the creator of heaven and earth, 
He loves what he creates and he sustains its life by his almighty presence. As creator, God absolutely transcends what he creates. He creates ex nihilo, that is, in the absence of any reality besides himself, and creator and creatures are not reciprocal or mutually determinative realities. But God does determine that he will coexist with creatures. He chooses fellowship. He determines that there should be a human creaturely reality which, in all the drastic difference of its being from the being of the creator, is the echo of his own incomparable personal being. God chooses that he will be present to and with these creatures, and that in its own fashion the creature will be present to him. And it is for this reason that God is loving creator, that there is a work of nature and a history of grace. Third, and um, nowadays a bit more controversially, the external works of God are the works of the undivided trinity. They are the essential works of God, the works of the Godhead in its essential unity. Now, contemporary Trinitarianism prefers a more robust and rather more colourful set of appropriations than these maxims allow. And it does so because it fears that otherwise we'll smuggle in the idea that God's essence is anterior to his personal relations as Father, Son and Spirit. Talk to any contemporary Trinitarian, is, uh, Trinitarian theologian and you'll get arguments along those lines very often. The fear, it seems to me, is actually groundless. The external works mirror the personal relations and characters of the triune persons. God the Father is the source of these external works, God the Son is their means, God the Spirit their perfection. But anything more graphic by way of an account of appropriation finds it difficult, I think, to avoid assigning particular spheres of economic work to one or other of the divine persons in a way which makes the, society, the Trinity a kind of society of coordinated agents. God's works originate in the Father, are executed by the Son and perfected in the Spirit. But that kind of talk informs us of the modes of action of the one God. It does not permit us to divide up the scope of God's works into three parts for three players. Or, as the maxim has it, the external works of the Trinity are indivisible. And with all this in place, uh, which of course would take several weeks of talking to defend it all, but we haven't got several weeks, with all this in place, let's proceed to omnipresence and providence, that is, the works of nature. And we'll begin with omnipresence. Is everybody still awake? Right, a bit of murmuring. The omnipresence of God. Okay, omnipresence can be considered as either an imminent or an operative divine attribute. That is, it can either be thought of as a property of God in himself or as a property of God's relations to creatures. As an imminent attribute, it can be designated immensity, that is, God being beyond all measure. As an operative or relative attribute, it can be designated ubiquity, God's being everywhere. Imminent and operative mustn't be separated. They're mutually informative. But they also need to be set in the correct sequence in which the operations of God flow from God's imminent being. It's because God is immense that God is omnipresent. His immensity is the boundless source of his sustaining presence to all things. In the work of nature, God is present to and upholds all things according to his purpose. But it's important to keep in mind that this work of God is not, as it were, an independent theme. It's a preface to, or a setting for, the work of grace. As the outer circle, the work of nature acquires its true significance from the inner circle. Above all, omnipresence and providence 
are not to be treated as bits of cosmological doctrine which furnish us with pre-evangelical general truths available apart from the confession of Emmanuel. Rather, they serve the history of redemption. Now, please note, this is not to say that cosmological considerations can be jettisoned. The collapse of God's omnipresence into God's existential presence to the believer is a very familiar disorder in modern theology. And it can only be achieved, it seems to me, by ignoring the perfect immensity of God and turning omnipresence into a wholly relative attribute with a narrowly anthropological cast. And against that, theology simply needs to remember that there really is a work of nature, that God's works are not restricted to the personal history of the redeemed. But, on the other hand, teaching about God's omnipresence isn't to be treated as something more basic and rationally available than God's redemptive presence. This, it seems to me, is precisely what happened in the history of natural religion and theology from the 17th century onwards. The cost of that kind of move, the move of omnipresence uh, into uh, natural religion, was, as it were, the inversion of the inner and outer circles, so that the real centre of gravity became the metaphysics of omnipresence. Divine omnipresence became a kind of naturally discerned substratum which provides for the coherence of the universe. But that, in turn, could only happen uh, by ignoring the fact that the work of nature is teleologically ordered. That is, it moves towards the covenant of grace in which omnipresence is completed as loving and saving fellowship. Now, if all that makes any sense, and um, actually having read it out, I'm not entirely sure it does to all of you, um, what it means is that we need to integrate and order immensity and ubiquity, imminent and operative. There is no immensity which is wholly apart from God's operative omnipresence. There is no ubiquity which is not grounded in God's free, transcendent perfection as the measureless one. God is free Lord of all things, without limit, and everywhere present in power and mercy. So first of all, then, God's immensity. God's immensity is the triune God himself in the boundless plenitude of his being, in which he is unhindered by any spatial constraint, and so is sovereignly free for creative and saving presence to all limited creaturely reality. In a good deal of the systematic literature, immensity is identified as a mode of God's infinity, and it tends to be expounded by describing a set of contrasts with limited spatial reality. So, for example, as the one who is immense, God is one to whom awareness, position, ubietas, may not be attributed. Why? Well, because location is a category pertaining only to creatures. Hence, God is without location, ilocalis is the term, and measureless, sine mensura. Now, these are important affirmations, but they're a bit risky, and they need to be qualified in at least two ways. First of all, God's infinity can't be thought of simply as an inverted image of the finite. Immensity as simply the antithesis of the local, something we reach by stripping away the attribute of spatiality, is not materially adequate to the boundless plenitude of the triune God. And, second, whatever we say by way of negation is only said on the way to a positive statement of God's immensity. The function of the negative is to bring into relief the particular perfection which God is. Infinity, in other words, is not indefiniteness or indistinctness of being. As the immense one, unconditioned by space, unrestricted as we are by relations of adjacency, God is not unspecific, he is this one. That means, therefore, that infinity is not lack of identity, it's intensive perfection. 
um, in Bavinck's phrase, uh, limitless in the intensive, qualitative, positive sense. Lack of finitude, transcendence of all circumscription and measure and limitation are the backcloth to the particular freedom in and as which God is God. To speak of God's absence of limitation is to indicate the boundless liberty of God to be who he is in himself and to act as he determines in relation to space. Immensity, concerns of plenitude, richness and sufficiency of God and of God's disposition of himself in relation to creaturely space. To put the matter a bit differently, God's immensity, we might say, is his transcendence of space. But as we've already said, I think, earlier in our questions yesterday, transcendence, like infinity, is best used non-comparatively. Its content can't be reached either by the magnification of creaturely properties, so that immensity is simple vastness, nor can it be reached by the negation of creaturely properties, so that immensity is simply the lack of spatial limitation. God's immensity is his qualitative distinction from creaturely reality, and therefore it can only be grasped on the basis of the way it's actually enacted in the ways and works of God. Um, in his remarkable book um, called The Dynamism of Space, uh, Ian Mackenzie, um, a largely kind of uh, forgotten uh, 20th century English theologian, says that immensity, th th sorry, that immensus, uh, the term immense applied to God, is an aspect of uncre uh, increatus, of God's uncreated being. That it points, he says, to the being of God as utterly qualitatively distinct from the existence of creatures, their attributes and limitations. Immensity, in other words, is not quantitative disparity. It's not just that there's more of God than us. It's what's called a differential of quality. God is a qualitatively different being. God's immensity, therefore, is the free, gratuitous, non-necessary relation to space. As the one who is immense, God's being has in itself its own particular depth, its plenitude and perfection in the relations of Father, Son and Spirit. God stands under no external constraints by virtue of the spatiality of created reality and his relation to creation does nothing to complete his being. Possessed of immensity, God is self-moved and replete. Now with this, of course, we can begin to see, can't we, how an evangelically formed understanding of immensity begins to lead us to a further thought, the thought of God's ubiquity, God's omnipresence. Immensity is the surpassing excellence of God which includes within itself the boundless capacity for nearness. It is a property of the transcendent fullness of God, but it's also the energy of his fellowship with creatures in the works of creation and incarnation. God's immensity thus includes his majestic priority over the space which he brings into being. He doesn't contain space, he doesn't surround it like a vast vessel, nor is he dispersed through space, nor is he spatially imminent in it as its life force, nor is he circumscribed by any of its places. Heaven and highest heaven cannot contain thee. Yet this doesn't denote the creator's absence. No, it denotes the free, unconditioned character of God's sustaining presence to spatial reality and of his employment of space as one of the media in which he makes himself known. The immensity of the triune creator of heaven and earth, then, is his unqualified transcendence of spatial relation even as the one from whose creative act all spatial relations originate and by whose providential work they are held in being. Immensity is at one and the same time the otherness of God over against created space and his limitless capacity to stand in relation to and act in space without compromising his freedom. And this, you can see, moves us into talking of God's omnipresence. The God who is himself 
limitlessly majestic, is present without restriction in and to his creation. God's unrestricted self-determination includes his determination to be present to the creation. In his immensity, not despite his immensity, but in it, God is everywhere present to the whole creation and is present to order, sustain and perfect it and to direct human creatures to fellowship with himself. Therefore, to God's immensity, there corresponds in the closest possible way his omnipresence. And all this is so because God's immensity is a perfection of his triune life. The full, unhindered majesty of God as Father, Son and Spirit includes his glorious self-presentation as the creator and reconciler who appoints all things uh, who, sorry, who appoints and brings all things to their fulfilment. His immensity, therefore, because it's his immensity, is not bare absence of relation. It's not just a kind of unchecked will operating in a void. God is immense as the Father who speaks the limitlessly effective word of creative love, as the Son who is the Redeemer and Head of the entire creation, and as the Spirit who is over all as the Lord and giver of life. In this triune act of free self-presentation and relation, God's immensity makes itself operative and known as his omnipresence in and providential ordering of the creation. So God's omnipresence then is his entire and constant presence in and to all things, the ceaseless and sovereign lordship in which the Most High, who is without measure or limit, inclines to be present to his creation and so holds it and renews it in life. How is the omnipresence of the God confessed in Christian faith to be characterised more closely? Well, in Scripture, it seems to me, God's presence is characteristically to be understood on the basis of his exaltation. God is God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. As transcendent creator, God possesses and rules the entirety of what he has brought into being because he is the one to whom heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it, belong. And because he's exalted in this way, he is uncontainable, most particularly, as we'll see, in relation to the temple, which can't in any way house God. Will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built. In the prophetic tradition, of course, this thought acquires greater polemical force as a protest against locative religion in which God and place are identified and sacred space is used to guarantee and therefore to tame or resist the divine presence. Do not trust in these deceptive words, Jeremiah says. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And the correction to this idolatrous conception of a local divine presence is not an emphasis upon God's remoteness, however. No, it's an appreciation of the entirely gratuitous character of his universal presence as the Most High. Precisely because he's uncontainable in a particular locale, God is present without restriction. His transcendence as maker and possessor of all space is the unhindered capacity he ha which he has um, to be in all places. His presence is omnipotent and unrestricted, and no creature can block or escape the judgment which it brings. Am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Above all, in Psalm 139, Ubiquity concerns God's majestic, unconstrained and therefore inescapable presence as the truth which discloses. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? To put all that in conceptual terms, if you want, God's omnipresence is a free mode of relation. It's a movement of the one who is replete in himself. But this doesn't mean that God's omnipresence is arbitrary or unstable 
or that there are occasions and places from which it might be withdrawn, occasional presence can't be omnipresence, for omnipresence is, without exception, universal. All places being comprehended in the ubi to which God wills to be present. The will of God is simple and therefore undeviating and dependable. Omnipresence has the unshakable reality of the divine promise. Its certainty and its constancy are that of the unqualified divine declaration, I am with you always. But the reliability of a promise is not that of a material or natural condition. A promise can't be converted into a state of affairs graspable apart from the freedom of the promiser without falling into idolatry. And as an aspect of God's work of nature, therefore, omnipresence is a relation rooted in God's aseity. It springs from, but in no way completes, the limitless sufficiency of God's self-relation as Father, Son and Spirit. So omnipresence is free relation, but also it's free relation. That is, the freedom of the triune God really includes a turning to the creation in its totality and to each particular within the creation. This relation is not just a state or condition, something which can be converted into a natural property of the creation without reference to God. God's omnipresence is not simply the presence of a kind of infinite, supersensible reality without physical limitations. It is the presence of the Lord God. It is purposive. It's not a simple cosmological fact, but in the course of God's dealings with his creation as its maker and as the agent of its reconciliation and perfection. Now, on the basis of that positive definition, uh, there are some negations which follow in thinking about God's omnipresence. God's presence is not definite, local or circumscriptive. That is, he's not present in the world after the manner of a finite physical body encompassed by space. Uh, Augustine again gives us some standard definitions. God, he says, is a spiritual substance not susceptible of division according to local distance or dimension or even confined within the limits of bodily members. And so, he says, God is not diffused through space or confined within limits, having one part in one place, another in another, a smaller in a less space, a greater in a larger space. Why does Augustine say this? Well, because the spatial relations of created bodies are definitive, but God is defined by no such relations. Take away the spatial relations of bodies, Augustine says, and they'll be nowhere. Because they are nowhere, they will not be at all. Take away bodies from the qualities of bodies, there'll be no place for them to be. And as a necessary consequence, they will not exist. Now, of course, Augustine's not just repeating Neoplatonic commonplaces. The negations for him are corollaries of affirmations. He doesn't stop short at emphasising the disembodied or non-spatial and non-dimensive character of God's presence. Such denials serve to draw attention to two positive affirmations. First, God is simple for Augustine, and therefore God, in his famous phrase, God is everywhere wholly present in himself. Second, the simple, self-moving, wholly present God is present not just as a kind of invisible spiritual substance, he's present creatively for Augustine. That is, he's present to sustain and rule the world. God is not a quality of the world, but the very creative substance of the world, he says. He rules the world without labour, he sustains it without effort. So in short, the triune God is present in all places, in free majesty, undividedly, not localised or extended, but spiritually, graciously and creatively present to undergird and order and glorify all things. And with that, let's move on a little bit to providence. In the work of nature, God freely and lovingly executes his determination to be the giver of life. As creator, God is present without restriction to what he creates 
And by his presence, he maintains and orders created reality so that it attains the end he has determined for it as its particular glory. Now, the doctrine of God's providential presence points backwards and forwards at the same time. It points back to the mystery of God's will, God's divine purpose. In providence, God administers the world in accordance with what he has determined before all time. And that means, therefore, crucially, that providence isn't just a kind of responsive presence of God. It's not just a kind of friendly companionship with creatures, which is simply what Ruth Page once called God's way of being with us and our way of being with God, sharing what happens en route, like two people who happen to be on the same bus or something like that. Now, providence is protological. That is, it executes the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. But providence also points ahead to the history of the covenant. And in this sense, it's teleological. In looking at the work of providence, that is, we're edging closer to the inner circle of the work of God's grace. Providence remains an outer work of God. It's not yet part of the special inner history, which God concludes with human creatures in the patriarchs and Israel and the church, whose central figure is Jesus Christ. But providence is ordered towards this special history. It, as it were, leads us to the border of the sphere of human fellowship with God. So, like omnipresence, providence is concerned with the coexistence of creatures, uh, of God's coexistence with the creatures whom God elects for himself. In his providential work, God is not simply the originating cause of the unfolding of created reality. No, he places himself alongside and with his creatures. In some measure, he determines that he will have a common history with them, that as their creator, he will be their God. So what do we say about this particular kind of coexistence of creator and creature? Well, first, uh, unsurprisingly, if you've been listening to the lectures so far, it's an asymmetrical relation. That is, there is no compromise of the sheer difference between uncreated and created being. God is present to the creature as he wills, freely, graciously, and only so is the creature present to God. God governs the creature in accordance with the ends he has determined, but the creature does not so govern God. God decrees and executes what he himself decrees, but the creature can only flourish as it waits upon his will. So God's being with the creature in his providential work is quite other than a passive divine imminence in which God is, once again, this is Ruth Page's word, alongside and contemporary. As Calvin says in a brilliant phrase, providence pertains no less to God's hands than to his eyes. Gosh, isn't that good? Isn't that good? But God's being with his creatures doesn't overrule creaturely being. That is, God orders creaturely existence purposively so as to perfect it in the history of grace, protecting it, so that it can fulfil its nature by attaining its end, which is fellowship with him. Creaturely, things, this is Bart, do not have their purpose and goal in themselves, or apart from the purpose and goal to which the covenant work of God hastens. They can only hasten with it in the one direction. But, Bart goes on, creaturely things do indeed serve the work and will of God. They participate in it. They execute what God has resolved in his free and omnipotent grace. That means that providence can't be understood only as an omnipotent divine movement. Because it is a work of God's loving will, it also has to be understood transitively, the medievals would have said. That is, as an act in which God confirms the life of what he has created and which it is his purpose to glorify. As the work of divine love... Providence is benefit, not just efficient cause. Its goal includes creaturely well-being, namely active life with God in the fellowship of those at whose head stands the Son of God. And so providence surrounds and supports the covenant of redemption. How do God's providential presence and activity promote life with God? Well, as in general with the doctrine of creation, this is a little kind of dogmatic rule, very little is to be expected from specifying the character of providential acts in advance of specifying the character of their agent. 
First of all, you talk about the agent, then you talk about the acts. Progress, I think, is usually made by tending to the identity of the one at work on the basis of which the conceivability of acts is then to be determined. In more directly theological terms, a doctrine of God's providential presence is to be shaped by the confession from him and through him and to him are all things. As it asks who this one is, dogmatics is going to have little investment in the notion of an omnicausal supreme being and its reflections will instead be led by a further confession. There is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So, if you want a little proposition, God's providential presence is the presence of the loving creator and perfecter who conserves, accompanies and governs his creatures. In the work of conservation, God maintains created reality in being. Creatures are from him, not only in the sense that creature being originates in his intention and action as creator, but also in the sense that creaturely being continues in its course only by his presence and power. Creaturely being endures because God is with it as its preserver. So conservation, in other words, is the enactment of God's fidelity. His relation to what he's made doesn't terminate with the act of creation. He continues to be with creatures, to be at each moment in the history of creatures the faithful one through whom they exist. Conservation, therefore, is the loving kindness of God who does not desire that creatures should perish and determines to be for them and with them. His compassion is over all that he has made. Now, God's preservation doesn't take the form of ever-renewed acts of creation. If it did, then the work of creation wouldn't be completed and creaturely being would have no intrinsic stability given to it by its creator it will be a kind of perpetual process of coming to be, continuous creation. Rather, in preservation, God works in creatures, preserving them by acting in and through the self-maintaining causality which he's bestowed upon them. This is what Aquinas says, for instance. During the whole of the thing's existence, he says, God must be present to it, and present in a way in keeping with the way in which the thing possesses its existence. And, because existence is more intimately interior to things than anything else, God exists intimately in everything. It's important to hear that right. Later rationalist philosophy and theology will coarsen Aquinas' delicate statement. It'll secularise him and turn his statement into... Into, uh, his statement about interior providential presence into something about, for instance, the imminent powers of the creature itself. And it'll do that because it wants to maintain God's autonomy. But for Aquinas, crucially, God's being in everything doesn't mean that God is no longer outside everything. The perfection of his nature places God above everything, he says, and yet as causing their existence he also exists in everything. As creatures preserve themselves, they are preserved by God. Second then, in the work of concurrence, God supports the operations of creatures. His presence accompanies creaturely action and so maintains the proper liberty and glory which it has by virtue of the summons of the creator to life. God works with the creature. Now, this isn't cooperation in the sense that a single work is jointly undertaken by two equal or at least commensurate agents. The creature has no independent powers of action and self-maintenance. All that the creature has and does is from and through God. But God's omnicausality is not God's sole causality. His active presence is omnipotent, but it's not limitless causal power, it's a creative power, that is, a power which establishes and works in, with and under the creaturely. God's active presence accompanies the creature in such a way that the creature is enabled to become what it is, namely, a creature. Not an autonomous centre of agency, but a being which truly has its being 
at the hand of God. But, third, God doesn't accompany creatures merely as one who reacts to the way they dispose of themselves. God governs creatures in his providence. His presence shapes the course of creaturely history, bestows on it the form and direction which are essential if creaturely being is to attain its given end. God's work of governance endows creaturely being and activity with sequence, connection, coordination and definite character. It makes it into an economy or an order of reality. God's governance is sovereign, incomparable and incommunicable. Is there a God besides me? He asks in Isaiah. But because it's his governance, the governance of the loving and purposive creator, then it doesn't degrade but elevate the creature. The God who is the king of all the earth is the object of our praise. Well, these brief remarks on the traditional threefold division of providence into preserving, accompanying and governing return us to the suggestion that providence is, as it were, the outer court of the kingdom of grace. Sometimes scholastic dogmatics distinguish God's universal or essential rule from his personal or economic rule. The distinction, as you'll readily see, is one between his providential disposing of all things and his special ordering of the history of the people of God in the sphere of the covenant. If we lay the material out in that way, it's crucial, of course, that God's universal rule not be allowed to stand as an independent theme. When that happens, it just becomes ripe for rationalist reduction. The goal of providence is the union of all things in Christ. He is the one for whom all things are created. There is therefore a necessary incompleteness to God's providential presence. It finds its completion only in Christ's lordship, which is not one small region of the essential rule of God, it is its universal consummation. The coordination of the work of nature and the work of grace, the ordering of providence to the economy of redemption, are both rooted in the unity of the triune God. A basic rule in the doctrine of providence is, there is one God. The God who is present to all creatures, whose presence maintains, accompanies and orders all creaturely occurrence, is the one who summons Israel as his people, who is present as Emmanuel, and around whose spiritual presence the church now gathers. All God's works, in other words, are held together by the singularity and unity of their agent. In providence, we encounter no other God than the Father who wills that there should be creatures, the Son who redeems creatures from death and draws them into his kingdom, and the Spirit who perfects them for their final end. And with that, of course, we arrive at the inner circle of God's presence, which is the history of the covenant. Let me just say a few things about that in closing. The covenant, I think, is the history of God's free, faithful and commanding presence. It appoints God's creatures to fellowship with himself. It blesses them with life in his presence and it summons them to obedience as a way of life. In the time available to us, I, I can only offer the most cursory sketch of the material. I can simply, that is, identify topics which ought to be covered in any adequate account and uh, uh, beg your indulgence on that. What do we need to say about covenant? Well, we need to say that within the wider sphere of creaturely occurrence and human undertakings in time, there takes place a special history marked out from all the rest. This special history is the history of the patriarchs of Israel and of the Church of Jesus Christ. It is temporal, that is, it's a visible historical sequence, a course of events in time, it's not angelic or mythological. It is spatial, that is, it takes place in particular locations, indeed in its course before the coming of the sun. It is deeply territorial, because land and covenant are so closely intertwined. It is social, that is, it's a history which takes place in the medium of certain forms of common life. It coalesces into institutional forms and arrangements. It is bounded, that is, part of its definition is given by its distinctiveness from and opposition to other histories and forms of common life and activity with which it comes into contact and from which it distinguishes itself. 
In all these ways, the history of the covenant has human extension. It is visibly natural. And yet there's a mystery about this history. It resists reduction to the dynamics of time, space, sociality and distinctiveness. These dynamics are its form, but they are not the inner essence from which its identity derives. To try to identify that inner essence, what lies at the heart of this mysterious history, we would need to say that it's a history not wholly enclosed within the sphere of eminent causality. And this, not simply in the sense that all creaturely occurrence is referred back to God as its creator and sustainer, but in a more precise sense. The source of this history is to be found in a taking or calling, a choosing and appointment which go beyond the relation of creator to creature. And so God addresses himself to Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. This history is special history because it is summoned into being and defined by the word of God. You are my servant. In short, the mystery of this history is that of election. Election isn't a modulation or accidental property of that history. It's its very essence. As a whole and in all its parts, throughout its course, it is covenanted to the God who has freely determined to be with it as the object of his choice. But how are we to understand this divine choice which generates this special sphere of creature history? Well, first of all, it's a matter of free sovereign determination of the good pleasure of God. Election is a decree in the sense that it doesn't take place in coordination with some other reality. It's like creation. It is a divine fiat. It is ex nihilo. It has no conditions for its occurrence other than the purpose and capacity of the creator. And further, election is gracious. It's a decision apart from, indeed against, desert. It was not because you were more in number that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you. The dynamic of election, therefore, is once you were no people, now you are God's people. Covenant means election, and election is uncaused origination. But something further needs to be said about this divine decree. Election is not only to be understood as gracious, prevenient cause, nor is it only selection and segregation, it is teleological. That is, its character is not simply that of a formal decree, it is more the energy of a history. God chooses that he will be for us, and so that he will be with us, and so that we will be with him, and that all this should take form as a temporal enactment. On the divine side, this means that God determines himself for fellowship with creatures. He doesn't need this. His perfect life in the communion of Father, Son and Spirit suffers no lack. But God loves the creature and so blesses it. And the blessing, quite simply, is his presence, his life with the creature. God determines that he will be with the creature in its time, that he will not revoke his presence, but ceaselessly refresh it in such a way that each episode in the creature's history is the place of God's presence. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. And on the side of the elect covenant partner, this means that fellowship with God is fundamental to creaturely being. But on this human side also, being in covenant with God is not just a condition or a status, it's a summons. By election, creatures are summoned to fulfil their nature by enacting the vocation which the covenant brings with it. The sphere of covenant and its blessings is therefore the sphere of obedience. And obedience here is not just a matter of resignation to an alien will, it's spontaneous conformity to nature, and so a means to life in fellowship with God. So covenant history is special history. But for the canon, it's the basic thread of human affairs. In it, 
God's primal relation to creatures is enacted. In all its particularity and contingency, it is this special history which continues the history of Adam after Adam broke fellowship with God and fled from his maker's presence. In this respect, therefore, the particular history of the covenant is universal history. In one sense, enclosed by, but in a far more important sense, circumscribing and recapitulating and bringing to fulfilment all other history, above all, in the climactic moment of God with us. But one last thing. There is, of course, a dark and inexplicable accompaniment to the history of the covenant, namely the continuance of Adam's sin, the pollution of fellowship, the repudiation of appointment to life in God's presence, the refusal actively to conform to our nature and direct ourselves to our end with God. One way of characterising this would be to say that it is a terrible absence of the creature from God, a not happening of the creature's existence in response to God's call. Sin, of course, is real human history. It is dreadfully alive. But in the end, it's a kind of negation the non-occurrence of the covenant from the side of the creature. It is not a mode of creaturely self-realisation, though it pretends to be such. It is, in fact, a self-unmaking. Sin is not being, but non-being. It is not life, but death. But sin is not outside the perfect lordship of God. God checks it. Sin does not repulse God as some power which he cannot master and from which he is forced to withdraw. The creature's failure to be with God is met by the intensification of his presence. In the person of his son, God comes to those who did not receive him. And doing so, he heals the broken covenant from his side and from ours. This will be our theme in our next lecture as we move to the centre of the innermost circle of God's presence, which is Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. We have time for questions from the floor. And, uh, or from the people sitting on the floor. Think about I will, it. I will climb the top. <laughs> I did. And my former colleague in faith in the East Lab. Um, Thomas Wynandy, in his book Does God Suffer, I think makes a similar point to what yep, you're yeah. making, that when God is with us, he is with us as the holy other one. Yeah. And Wynandy is concerned to um, uh, correct the misconception about a climate in doing so. Uh, you tried to, mis or, or to correct misapprehensions about Barth. Yep. Um, are Aquinas and Barth saying something similar? It would be interesting if yeah. they're both conceptually elaborating the God of the gospel in the same way. Yeah. And, and are you uh, doing some revisionist theological history here? Today? I, I, th I think that's right, Kevin. I, I, I do think that on this issue of divine suffering, both uh, Barth and Aquinas really are just central figures in the, in the Christian tradition. I mean, Aquinas is quite clear, of course, that God is with us. He's quite clear that to deny that God has real relations to creatures doesn't mean that God is kind of unfriendly and unconcerned. It just means that God is not at the mercy of creatures. And therefore, precisely because he's not at the mercy of creatures, he can help them. And it seems to me that's exactly what Bart wants to say. I mean, you know, in the discussion of, um, of impassibility, Bart says we need to go fairly close to heresy on this point. We need to affirm that God really is active within the creation and puts himself in the creature's distress. But it really is him putting himself there. And there's no way in which this means that God, as it were, collapses under the weight of, um, of, of creaturely distress. Um, and, and that, it seems to me, is, I mean, you could sum it up with that little tag, can't you, to say that God suffers impassively. Um, that, I think, is what both Aquinas and Bart are trying to get at. Yeah, it is. A little more broader by moving away from impossibility. Yep. Uh, would we 
be correct to infer that with regard to the God of the Gospel, Aquinas and Bart are working a similar conceptual elaboration on that, mm. and, and would Bart agree with you? <laughs> or that, that he is doing the same <laughs> thing as Aquinas? That's a good question. Uh, it depends which day of the week I think you talk to Bart on that one. Um, I mean, there are, there are the passages where he's um, calm about Aquinas, um, which means he's not worried about the analogy being. Um, he's quite happy basically to treat Aquinas as, as a bit like one of the Protestant scholastics, giving him all sorts of conceptual tools to think through what's happening in Scripture. Um, and there are points at which he will simply draw on that material. Um, the points at which he gets polemical against Aquinas are when he's got in sight certain kinds of Catholic dogmatics that he thinks may go back to things in Aquinas. Often he's a bit wrong in thinking that they go back to Aquinas. But in terms of basic um, dogmatic structure, there are all sorts of similarities, especially on non-controversial topics like the doctrine of God. Uh, I noticed in listening uh, to this lecture, actually, a lot of similarities to uh, Schleiermacher's approach in the Christian faith. Uh -oh. Sorry to accuse you of that. Um, uh, but uh, in particular, his, uh, his dislike of the, ne the via negativa, the via eminentia, in, in his case, a preference for the way of causality. And, and uh, uh, in the Christian faith, he he views all these attributes that you're discussing as modalities of, of causality, so that omnipresence is how God is sustaining and preserving all that exists yeah. in the world, and uh, as omniscience is his sort of the telic aspect of his causality. Uh, is there a similarity? Is that a, a good sort of category to subsume these other attributes that you're discussing, or the differences? Well, th I mean, the similarity, I think, is that when he's talking about the divine attributes, he emphasizes the operative um, aspects of, 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 of the divine attributes. And insofar as I'm saying something about the operative divine attributes, then uh, there are things certainly where I want to line up with what, uh, what Schleiermacher is doing. He's generally pretty reluctant to talk about the divine attributes in terms of their relation to the, to the immanence of God. Um, and at that point, um, I, I think I, I would just need to, uh, to pull away from him. Um, he, for instance, um, um, thinks the notion of immensity is just a kind of pointless bit of doctrine. Uh, uh, omnipresence he's, he's, he's happier with. Uh, but he stands, in s for me at least, fairly early on in that tradition that has been so strong, in, particularly in Protestant dogmatics, of thinking through the divine attributes in terms of how are they experienced as modes of God's activity towards creatures um, and that's all one needs to say about them and, and, and that it seems to me is going to be well deficient first of all in terms of theology proper because one needs to say more than that about God and second it's going to be deficient in terms of how you understand the operative attributes in relation to us because if they're detached in that way from God's imminent being then they become rather different animals than they might otherwise be now wh whether that's as kind of nuanced an account of Schleiermacher as needed, well, well I'm pretty sure it isn't, uh, but, but um, I, I'm, I'm at least nervous, I think, about what Schleiermacher doesn't say about the divine attributes, shall we say. Is your uh, conception of um, providence and how it works in conjunction with uh, omnipresence and, and behind that of course with immensity does it shed any light on how we might try to appreciate in the covenant of redemption the realm of hell and God's creatures that will reside in the realm of hell you know I have to say I'm not entirely sure what to think about that Give me some help. I mean, g give me a version of it, of how it might, and I'll re respond to <laughs> that. <laughs> I don't know if I have a version, but, um, but of course, his, uh, there's a teleo teleological end 
um, which you were talking about, well, and it's all it's uh, consummated with with God being with us in in a, uh, a way that He's both um, not contingently and yet yet uh, in in some sense uh, uh, inhabiting us, but yeah. yet. Um, Hell is is a is the a realm of God, but but where His uh, reign within the within His creatures is is a completely different end. Yeah. Th- th- than the end that is in the New Jerusalem, the consummation. Yeah. So how might we, without uh, at least in in in, a gli- in in some small sense, try to appreciate how yeah. providence plays a role in that? Well, you certainly want. If you, I mean, if you want a doctrine of hell, you would have to talk about it as a subsect of, of rule, wouldn't you? That, that I think, would, would have to be a beginning point. Otherwise, um, it, it would attract the notion of um, a, a punishment separated from God's nature. And that, that, that won't do it. That, that is what people will often react against, wrongly react against in the notion of hell. But, but it seems to me that, that the notion of hell has to be a subsection, therefore, of the fulfilment of the divine purpose and of God's uh, ordering of reality. Now, you've, you've then got to face the issue, um, what kind of rule are we talking about if it is exercised in the presence of that which is irredeemably opposed to God? And I just don't know what to make of that. Um, because... If you go in certain directions, you end up basically having to cut out a certain amount of the canonical witness. On the other hand, if you go in another kind of direction, you can end up very quickly in a kind of dualism in which uh, God reaches a limit. Now, the clue, it seems to me, would have to be spelling out, therefore, how God's rule is exercised in... Um, eternal punishment or eternal destruction or something like that in a way which doesn't lead God into some kind of sort of manichaeistic um, uh, uh, picture. Now, quite how that fits in with providence, I'm, not, I'm, I'm still not quite sure how the, how the providence angle comes into your question. Well, only, only in that the, in the larger um, scheme of things, how God is ordering all things to, to be in a covenant relationship with those he's created. And how hell uh, Yes, subver- I mean, that's normally that. done, yeah. that would be normally done, to, uh, wouldn't it, through a doctrine of reprobation, though, rather than a doctrine of providence. Um, I mean, part, part of the difficulty is that, that um, providence is a bit of a porous term, isn't it? It, 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 can, um, it can attract more material, less material, depending on how you kind of dispose of it. Quite what you make of the doctrine of reprobation, it seems to me, is another really tricky and actually pretty important term, topic that... Um, it tends to be kind of out of radar range, doesn't it, these days? But Kevin is now going to well <coughs> put it back. Could you parse the doctrine of hell for us, not in relation to providence, but in relation to presence, God's presence? Um, I think at one point you said he, his, he is able to will his presence, and that means he could withhold his will. But on the other hand... Um, does he, does he have to relate to hell even to sustain it? Does God sustain hell in which there is a kind of providential personal presence yeah. there? Or yeah. is yeah. hell the absence of God's presence? Well, yeah, um, I think you, have to, you, you would have to say that if there is a reality, if there is a sphere of being called hell, then God must be present in it because it is not possible for there to be being from which God is uh, is absent. Otherwise, it would not be. Now, I mean, w- when Augustine talks about this, you know, he, he says, yes, okay, we grant that point. To f- for there to be creaturely being, there has to be God present to it, otherwise it would not be. But there is also another kind of relation which God has to creaturely being, in which God is present in certain ways, what he calls inhabitation to those um, who uh, respond to God's offer. And there is another kind of presence, an unequal kind of presence, in which God is present to those who reject him. Um, so you might be able to, to, to develop in those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of terms, and it might be possible to develop a, um, a doctrine of, of hell out of, out of that. Um, you would certainly require some kind of pretty complicated 
kind of complicated ontology, it seems to me, to get that sorted out. Um, that's why a kind of, uh, I mean, that's part of the attraction of annihilationism, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it annihilates not only sinners, but also the problem, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, the issue really is whether you're allowed scripturally to, to go for that, because, I mean, with the best in the world, it's a drastically simple solution, and it's kind of too neat, um, attractively neat, but possibly too neat. Well, I mean, I think it's going to have to be, um, it's, it's going to have to be treated as a section of God's rule. Uh, what you're going to have to say that um, God's self-glorification uh, includes his continuous triumph over uh, that which opposes um, his, his will and repudiates its own being. Now, you would probably, gosh, I'm thinking on my feet, you'll probably need to have some You, you probably have to have some sort of event language around that, I think. Um, because in one sense, repudiating God is repudiating one's own being. I mean, that, that's the fourth of, sa uh, of saying, uh, talking about the relationship in Scripture, it seems to be between sin and death. I mean, to sin is not to choose another way of being alive. It's to, cho it's to choose not to be. So you'd have to talk about how possibly, in terms of, this is a kind of continual choosing not to be on the part of that which turns away from God, or something like that. We need another question. Yeah, we do. Pretty swiftly, please. <laughs> <laughs> Flower arranging, gardening, I'll do it. <laughs> on, the on the concurrent, can you flush out a little more how scripturally freedom plays, or how it acts in this idea of concurrence, because you said yeah. it enables the creature to be which it is, a creature. Yeah. But I, I just kind of feel like uh, the creaturely freedom part, can you flush that out a little bit for us? Yeah. Uh, the clue, it seems to me, uh, uh, basically is getting our heads out of the idea um, that God's freedom and our freedom are antithetical. They're not inversely proportional, they're directly proportional. Therefore, um, the more that God acts upon us, the more we ourselves are enabled to act. God's acting upon us is not the suppression of our agency, but it's the creation of our agency. Now, th the difficulty we have is that m most of the time when we think about freedom, we think in terms of spontaneity. So my freedom has to be the absence of external causality upon my acts. But the Christian tradition just doesn't think like that. Well, at least it didn't until the later 17th century. Um, I mean, for Augustine, God causes all that is. And that's why we're free. That's not, it's not in opposition to our freedom. It's precisely the cause of our freedom. What we find difficult to get our minds around is the idea that there could be a freedom which is caused or given to us. Because we think that the only kind of freedom that we can have is either pure spontaneity or what's sometimes called contra-causal freedom. In other words, our freedom to act against a cause acting upon us. And that picture is not, it seems to me, part of the way that scripture in the Christian tradition has, has thought. And if you want, it's that, it seems to me, which is often at play in debates about um, open theism or whatever. You know, the, the fear that if we talk about God's sovereignty, we must therefore be talking about something which is a subtraction from creaturely freedom. To which the answer is, no, it isn't. Even though God is a primary cause, that's is, is that yeah, basically what you're I mean, the, the, I mean, the simple distinction in the medievals between primary and secondary causality is, is a good way of handling it. Um, I, I am the cause of my moving from here to here. God is the cause of my moving from here to here. There are two ways of talking about the same acts, and they're not contradictory. Thank you. Next, Lordham. Of definitive presence. 
spirituality of divine omnipresence on the one hand and the utter physicality of locative or circumscriptive presence on the other hand. Um, so, so the kind of thing that angels have, you mean? It was used to talk about yeah. how many angels can dance yeah. on the head of a pin. Yeah. It's also used in Protestant Eucharistic theology. Yeah. It's yeah. used as an analogy for the presence of the soul in the body. I wonder if, in your thinking, the danger of idolatry and locative religion is so uh, severe, so imminent, such a, such a significant threat that we need to avoid this traditional scholastic middle kind of presence. Or if you think it simply collapses into a form of locative presence. If it collapses into a form of? It seems like, if for you, definitive yeah. presence does collapse into locative, locative presence. Is. There's not a significant difference. Um, I mean, I, th I, th Doug, I think probably, I'm thinking on my feet again, I think probably it would depend on the kind of description you gave of it. Um, I mean, I'm thinking, for, for instance, in Eucharistic theology, it probably would be possible, wouldn't it, to talk about the mode of Christ's presence in relation to the Eucharistic assembly, which wasn't purely locative, nor purely, um, uh, this, this is a purely human action which is being observed by an absent uh, enthroned Lord or something like that. Um, it would be it would be possible to do that. You'd need to make sure that the definitions were just so tight that you didn't, you know, slip over one side or the uh, or the other. Um, I mean, my instinct, I think, is to want to to want to try that. Um, it requires quite a lot of conceptual work, doesn't it, that we don't easily do and it may also i mean in eucharistic theology it may also fall into the problem that we if we're not careful in eucharistic theology end up talking about objects rather mm -hmm. than about uh, objects insofar as their modes of personal encounter or something like that uh oh <laughs> 